<clears throat> Welcome to Legends in Leadership, brought to you by ISF and the Carrington Group. Legends in Leadership is an inspirational podcast featuring the stories of leaders who are making a difference. Our goal is to inspire you with the stories of leaders who come from humble beginnings, overcome challenges, and ultimately rise up to make a difference in people's lives. Well, good morning, folks, and welcome to Legends in Leadership. This is Jason Smith. I'm your host for episode number 70, and I'm a family officer with the Carrington Group. Joining me today are my co-host, Tyler Tallman, a fellow family officer at the Carrington Group, and Dr. Blair Ritchie, Executive Director of the International Student Foundation. It's great to be back in the studio with you guys hey, this morning. Jason. It is. Episode number 70. Yay. Rolling right come. along. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Well, as we do every week, we're going to have a little bit of leadership trivia to start the show with Dr. Blair. So what do you have for us this morning? All right, guys. 25 years ago today, one of my boyhood heroes passed away. And I think you guys are going to get this one because his legendary status transcends generations. His father and his grandfather taught him how to hit a baseball from both sides of the plate. And at the age of 19, he was told to fill the shoes of Joe DiMaggio. Over the next 18 years, he played in 20 All-Star games, won seven World Series, was a three-time American League MVP, and my favorite, won the Triple Crown in 1956. He became the king of baseball memorabilia, arguably the most popular player in the history of the game. Unfortunately, he struggled with alcoholism, that left his personal life in shambles. But his story is one of amazing redemption. He insisted at his funeral that a poem be read, and the great Bob Costas, who reminded the world at that event that there is a difference between heroes and role models, read the poem, God's Hall of Fame. So who is this legendary leader? I'll be back at the close of the program with the answer All I can on that. think of is, is just a picture of Bob Costas on the Olympics right now. That's there it. There you go. <laughs> I want Bob Costas to do my funeral. Think you will? Uh, he might. He might. That'd be an elegant funeral. <laughs> well, we're excited to welcome Andy Harvey to the podcast today. Uh, his leadership experience covers both military and law enforcement professions. Uh, he retired as the first sergeant of the 136th Mission Support Group in Fort Worth after a distinguished military career with over 20 years of service. Harvey deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and led during a crisis in New Orleans just days after the destruction uh, via Hurricane Katrina. During his enlistment, Harvey attended several military academies, including the Non-Commissioned Officer Academy at McGee Tyson Air Base in Tennessee and the First Sergeant Academy at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. He earned the Distinguished Graduate Award and the coveted Commandant's Leadership Award, respectively. Harvey also retired from the Dallas Police Department and has served as the Chief of Police in Palestine, Texas, in his Texas, and as we were just updated now, in FAR, Texas. As a member of the Dallas Police Department, Harvey commanded patrol, investigations, community relations, and media relations. As a patrol watch commander, Harvey implemented a policing model that places high value in team members' contributions promotes problem solving, excellent customer service, a heightened sense of responsibility, and develop team members' ability to think critically. Uh, Harvey champions community policing, having authored a book titled Excellence in Policing, which has been presented to and read by police of all ranks around the country. Harvey is a speaker and is frequently interviewed on local and national news programs and is a host of his own podcast that covers topics on excellence and confidence. Harvey just released his new topic, Lion Up, Become the Leader Others Need You to Be. Nice. So we're excited to have um, uh, Andy on the show today and uh, looking forward to getting to know him a bit more and more about his stories. Welcome. What a journey. Wow. It's great to be on with you. It, it has been quite a journey. So just to be on with you is, uh, is really a highlight of it, right? Because you're, you're, uh, you're highlighting uh, le legends and leadership. I don't think I'm there yet, but uh, just to be <laughs> hanging out with you is pretty cool. So uh, hopefully you've done something right 
in order to be here with you today. <laughs> well, definitely interested in um, what inspired you and motivated you to uh, seek out the military and, and law enforcement careers. Well, you know, life just kind of happened, and I'll be honest, I, I, I didn't, um, it wasn't one of those lifelong dreams. You know, a lot of people want to be police officers as a kid, and that's what their ultimate goal is. I got to tell you, it just didn't work out like that for me. Uh, I was young, I was married young, we had a, a, a baby, and uh, and I knew that I had to do something uh, that, that I think would provide some stability for my family, and uh, I saw that Dallas the Dallas Police Department was recruiting in San Antonio and uh, one weekend and I said you know what I'm not doing anything this weekend let me go check it out and see what that's about well three months later I'm sitting in their police academy in, in Dallas Texas and so it just kind of happened but I, I got to tell you there's there was a reason for that I have no doubt because um, it, it turned out to be an, a great career great journey in Dallas I learned a lot I grew a lot and uh, just been a blessing for me and my family. And then the military side was uh, also just a way for me to get away and, do, and try something different. I did it at a very young age, so I was able to retire uh, in the military reserve-wise. And, and uh, so I was able to do that uh, in the military and in Dallas, and now I'm a police chief. So um, did a lot of things very early on that allowed me to be where I'm at today. Uh, and hopefully with the energy to keep going for a while. Yeah. Well, your experience with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans is, a, is especially interesting to me. I, I grew up in New Orleans and uh, my parents and siblings still live there when Hurricane Katrina um, caused such devastation. So I'm curious with your, with your efforts there, you know, how did, how did that shape um, sort of your career going forward and what did that experience teach you about the role of, uh, of police and military help in our country? Well, it, it did. It was a, it was an extraordinary experience, you know, to be in New Orleans just a, just a couple of days after Katrina hit, and to see New Orleans and to see it almost like a third world country uh, was really something that I think about even today. Uh, looking back, and I'm thinking, wow, where where were we? And uh, it certainly didn't look like like the United States or New Orleans that we're used to. It's just a, an unbelievable experience. Here's what happened on that. Uh, we were told we were going to go for a couple of days because if you remember, there was a lot of unknowns. There was a lot of stuff going on. We didn't know what that looked like. There was supposedly a lot of violence and uh, looting and that kind of thing. So we were just going to go down there, get this for two days, wow. <laughs> just to kind of settle things and stabilize things down in New Orleans. Uh, ended up being 30 days or at least 30 days. And so, but get this, we only went with just, they, they said, just take one or two uniforms. <laughs> right. not going to be there long. It's going to be a quick thing and ended up being uh, over a month. And uh, what an experience that was. Hmm. Yeah, and, and definitely, I think um, the residents too thought this would just be a couple of days. And, and uh, as multiple hurricanes had passed through there before, um, you know, things would get back to normal in relatively quick order, but clearly uh, that's that's not what ultimately happened. So I'm curious what shaped your view of police work and the work that you've done to uh, de-policing uh, concepts into into the work of, of policing. Well, it, like, as, as you know, policing is at the top of one of the national discussions and uh, just a very When I was going through grad school and doing some research and what I wanted to know was what is it that we're doing in policing that is really impactful in other words I, I, I really don't like doing things for the sake of doing things so that we can tell people we're doing things but it's not really making an impact so I was really curious to see how the community perceived us how, how do you perceive us the police and, and how can we manage that and how can really how can we do things and policing that are impactful. And so I did my research and one of the things that I came across was a, this, this concept of procedural justice. And uh, it basically what that says is um, that people are more interested in how they're treated, uh, whether or not they're treated with a fundamental fairness, dignity and respect, even more so than the outcome. So there were studies done that showed this 
uh, when, when people would encounter the, uh, the police. And so I thought I got to thinking, wow, if people are more concerned or interested in how they're proven policing, uh, and, and I think it goes down to the very micro level of policing, and that's every single citizen encounter and how and how we manage that. So if we understand that human dynamic that occurs when we encounter a citizen, then perhaps we can manage that a little bit better, make better decisions, and at the end, still have satisfactory results from the citizen and also keep us both safer. So what does that transition look like as this is this has become a national conversation, a national topic? Um, I guess maybe the word de-escalation of, of these interactions is something I'm hearing more and more. So how do you help move from um, some of the, the less um, beneficial interactions to more of the type of interactions you're describing? Well, the, the, we're, we're, there's still lots of work to do and, part, and most of it is this. This is what I'm finding. We see this all the time is that our two worlds are still colliding. We don't, uh, we still lack lots of mutual understanding. We just don't understand our worlds and it shouldn't be that way. We're really one world. And so this idea that it's us against them uh, really needs to be uh, done with. We need to move past that and go into that one world where we, all, we are all a part of. I say this quite a bit uh, that for us in policing, wearing a uniform doesn't separate you from the community it actually makes you more a part of it so for us we have to acknowledge uh, and really understand how you perceive us and, and so with all the stuff that's going on in, in our country and in our world we have to be in tune with that and be sensitive to that and acknowledge and learn um, really the root of what is going on and how you perceive us and, uh, but it needs to be twofold. The community also needs to learn about our world, but we can only control what we do in policing. And so our job is to hopefully be the example and also um, educate and enlighten uh, citizens on how we do and what, what our job is. Because let's face it, one of the challenges we face is that many people still believe, they really believe that they know our job and they try to simplify it in ways that is uh, not fair to anyone. Because this is a tough gig and dealing with people is a tough, as, as you know, it's very, it's it can be very challenging. And so when we understand our worlds, mutual and increasing mutual understanding, we will be better for it. I'm curious, Andy, uh, you've obviously uh, taken a pathway through various size uh, cities and municipalities and, uh, you know, being a police officer in Dallas, uh, obviously a very large city and now uh, in, in, in a much smaller town. What are what are some of the challenges with larger municipalities versus smaller municipalities and 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 how do you combat that? And a great question. I'm, br I'm glad you brought that up because I have learned that policing is the same whether we're in Dallas or East Texas or now in South Texas or wherever you are in the United States or world. Uh, people expect the same things from their police. And I go back to what I just said. They want to be treated with a fundamental fairness, dignity, and respect. When we do that, then we have better outcomes. So in that sense, policing doesn't change a whole lot. What people expect from us doesn't change a whole lot. The question is, are we listening and are we changing the way we police? Because historically, we have been very resistant to change. The world and society is changing so fast now that if we're not intentional about what we're doing, we're going to stay and, and be kept uh, behind. We're going to be behind. And so we need to be very intentional. We need to be listening. But it's the same whether you're in Dallas or in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, policing is the same. People want and expect the same things. It's up to us to listen and understand what those are and, and do it in a way that that's adding value to our communities. And I think one of the things that the community, for better or for worse, begins to expect is to hold those 
in these positions to a, even a higher standard than might be expected of an average citizen. Um, how do you encourage, train, support officers in a role where they are under a microscope and expected to be uh, a better example of a human being than the average human being expects of themselves? Well, again, I think it's important to note this, and part of that mutual understanding is, let's face it, we are human as well. Yes, we should be held to a higher standard, but here's the reality. We fail. We are human. We make mistakes. Now, some are a lot more egregious than others, and we have to deal with them accordingly. But, but I got to tell you, and this is what I found when I speak with people and citizens that have a complaint on an officer or whatever that is, uh, uh, again, right, uh, a picture, uh, uh, and I try to be very real with them as far as the challenges of our job and the part that, listen, we are not robots. And here's what I think is important. When we do fail, uh, I learned a long time ago from Chief Kunkel, who was a uh, mm -hmm. former chief in Dallas, Texas, and really taught me a lot. He kept it very simple, and, and it's, it applies today as it did even, you know, 10, whatever, 15 years ago, that when we mess up, we fess up, and then we clean up, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how we respond to uh, mistakes and, and things that we do, we have to respond to that because they're going to happen. And to think that we are going to be perfect and not make the best decisions at times is just being unrealistic. Now, we want to be excellent. That's why I named my book Excellence in Policing. Mm -hmm. uh, but part of being excellent is making mistakes. But in how, and when we do when we make mistakes, how do we respond to that? And I think that's extremely important uh, when, when, when talking to citizens and, and, and increasing that mutual understanding. And to be fair on that mutual understanding topic, you know, um, from the citizens' perspective, I, I saw a, a news segment where an individual who was protesting police years ago actually went on a ride along and then uh, also went through firearms training, situational training, and it did change his perspective on that split second decision to, to pull a weapon on, a, on an individual. So how, how can the average citizen open up and become more aware of the police perspective to begin to close the gap from that side as well? Well, that's one way for sure. Come out and ride with us. You'll see that the world is different in a squad car. Mm -hmm. And there's something about it. When you get in a squad car, you see people looking at you different. You see things from a different lens. And that's what we all have to do. We have to look at each other's world from your lens. So come on and, and look at it from our lens. Just ride out one night. Mm -hmm. And you'll see um, the, 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 how difficult this job can be at times. Now, uh, most of most of the time, this is a fun job. This is a very rewarding job, helping people. We really, really do that, and that's a lot of fun and 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 dealing with all kinds of things. And so, I think what people will find is when they come and look at the world from a squad car, is that they'll see it in a different way, but they'll also appreciate some things that that even they may not have uh, uh, thought about for their own life because they'll see up a little bit of everything. Yeah. And uh, so I, I invite people to do that. That's a great way of doing it. And just come on and hang with us. We want to hang with you. Just come on and, and hang with <laughs> us. And I bet you, I, have, I'm, I guarantee that you will see it a little bit differently than before um, than before you came out and hang out with us. So I actually did a ride along in, in college as part of an intro to criminal justice. And what I still laugh about today is how people put their brakes on. You know, we're, we're driving down I-30. <laughs> And as soon as people notice a car, all the brake lights uh, oh, yeah. pop on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm curious, in your journey, you, you obviously spent plenty of time uh, in a squad car, um, and now you're, you're wearing this sharp suit and you're in a completely different position. So what do you, what do you, what do you miss most about uh, the, the role uh, of being on the streets uh, and, and in a squad car versus where, where you are today? It's, it's those interactions, it's those encounters that we have with people. Most of them, the, the vast majority are so positive and uh, it's just a lot of fun being out there. There's nothing best or better for me than to being in a squad car with your partner whom you trust and and just make, make the best of it and have a good time. Uh, and, and there's nothing better than that. This is a great 
job, I'm telling you. And once you get to this level and you're in an office and all that, it, your world changes because your audiences changes and we have to change. It's a different gig now, right? Being in administration is different. But uh, nothing will replace being in a squad car with someone that, that you that you enjoy being with, answering calls, helping people, and getting into some really dicey stuff sometimes. Uh, a lot of it is, 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 um, is just a lot of fun. There's nothing better than that. And let's face it, we really don't have anyone other than people's cameras. But I'm talking about a, a boss that is looking over your shoulder and, and looking at every single little thing that you do. Uh, you have some freedom, and that's a great thing. A, a lot of people don't have that in their professions. So I miss that. I miss the camaraderie. I miss the, the, the playing around and the joking around that we have with each other at that level, especially out in the field. And so I miss that. And uh, because it, they say it gets lonely at the top, uh, it can get that way and, and feel that way at times. But no, again, nothing better than being in a squad car and, and going out and trying to help help people. And uh, again, that's just a lot of fun. And um, so, yeah, that, that, I do miss that for sure. So you guys are uh, you're, you're way down in South Texas now. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on down in South Texas and some of the challenges that you guys are facing there. You know, it, it's good it's, for me. It's good to be. It's it's a coming home. I was born and raised down here, <laughs> and I left and went to San Antonio and then to Dallas for many years and been around the state. Now I'm back home where I was uh, where I was where I was born and raised. Uh, so the valley, they call it the valley, of course, the Rio Grande Valley, is not the same valley that I left. It is growing. It is robust. It is uh, it is a different world now. Now we have our challenges. One of the uniqueness down here are is the, that we have international borders, and we have one in this city, in the city of Far, and so that's a whole other dynamic that very few, obviously, agencies and and police chiefs uh, have to, um, to to deal with. So that in itself presents a, another kind of unique challenges. But right now with COVID, this is one of the hot spots. And so trying to manage all of those things is uh, keep, keeps us pretty busy here. So, uh, but, I, but I gotta tell you, the people here are, are just good people. Uh, good, a lot of them are just very humble people. And to see the growth here is really something. Uh, I'll give an example. I have a 140 officers in this city alone. Uh, so it's not as, as small as, as some people may think. Next door to me in McAllen, uh, they're about 150,000, probably more than that in Edinburgh and Mission. So you put all those cities together, now you're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in one area, and they have everything you want here, except for the Dallas Cowboys. You know, my Cowboys <laughs> aren't down here. But, but, but everything else is here, and so uh, it, it's really a different place, and I'm really glad to be back. So you're you're in the process of, uh, or you you wrote uh, your own book, and so I'm curious. There's always somebody or something that inspired you uh, through your leadership journey to write that book. So talk about maybe some uh, the pieces that uh, you've read, or, or some folks that have been an influence on you that have uh, really kind of shaped your leadership journey. Yes. So I read a lot of uh, leadership books, obviously, and I love I love I love books. I'll tell you what, I love books that help me think critically. I think in this job is another piece is that we have to think critically. So I like to think differently. I love Malcolm Gladwell. If, if, if you haven't read uh, Talking to a Stranger, it, it's an incredible book. I just read that not too long ago. David and Goliath uh, is what, another one that he read. And I'll tell you, it makes you think. And if we're not thinking differently, because leaders have to think differently and critically, if we're not doing that, then we're not growing. And if we're not growing, we become irrelevant. And if we become irrelevant as a leader, then you got nothing. You have hit your lid, as they say. And so I love books like that. Uh, the reason I wrote this book is I wanted to, it's just my little two cents to hopefully help the profession that that I still believe is a noble profession, and and if I can help even this much, uh, in, in, in with our noble profession and helping it uh, add value somehow, that, then I feel like I did something for the profession outside of my organization, and so it was a, one of the most challenging things that I did, and it's not listen, it's not a big book, it's nothing uh, pro, profound in a sense, but I'll tell you, writing it helped me probably more than anybody else because it challenged me to really think about things 
and, and uh, so it helped me. And, and and the feedback that I get from it is that, well, it's so it's just a it's so basic. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a, the message is nothing, again, profound. It's a basic message, uh, but they needed to hear it. Yeah. And I provide stories in there that just help them. Oh, you know what? That's right. So it's just a refresher on a lot of things we know. Mm -hmm. I just packaged it, hopefully, in a way that that makes sense to people and I try to simplify it for, for others. So before we wrap up, share with us how people can find the book, follow you, and kind of get connected with uh, your message and, and the materials that you're, that you're creating. Well, well, thank you for that. You know, my book, Excellence in Policing, is available on Amazon, and it's very easy to find. It's also on audiobook. Now, I actually read this aloud, and that was a whole other experience. So <laughs> it's on audiobook. You can listen to it within about two hours. Hopefully, it's an enjoyable one for you. Uh, you can find that on Audible and, and other platforms. Uh, but but I'm easy to get a hold of on, on LinkedIn, Andy Harvey, Excellence in Policing. I'm on social media, on Twitter. But LinkedIn may be the best way. Excellenceinpolicing.tv is my website. Mm -hmm. And and I'm updating it now. But you can still get a hold of me by, uh, by emailing me at Andy at Excellenceinpolicing.tv. And so uh, I'd love to hear from anyone uh, out there that wants to learn more about this. I just love the conversation. And, and Andy, appreciate your uh, perspective. And I think we'd be remiss to, to not uh, thank you for your service to our country uh, and to our communities as a public servant and, and all the hard work that you guys put forward uh, to keep us safe and, and to keep this uh, great country safe as well. Well, I'm absolutely honored, and uh, I, I love the fact that uh, I was able to do that and, and uh, to give back some way. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be on your show as well. And uh, so, so thanks again for having me, and I, I just uh, hope to uh, continue this conversation with you and anybody else that would like to continue. So thanks again for having me. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Trivia, Blair, what do you got, buddy? Andy, you want to take a chance at this one? Uh, you're a baseball fan at all? No, and I was thinking, and you got me. I, I was thinking, you know, way before 1956. So no, I'm not. I'm not going to get this one right. <laughs> All so, right so, but but I do want to know the answer. So, I'm so this away. is the guy. This is a guy who took over for DiMaggio in the Yankee outfield, uh -huh. and uh, he's he's a Dallas guy, by the way. I mean, he died in oh, Dallas, passed is... away in Dallas, and played a lot of golf down here too. I, my there. my son kept me up too late last night. My <laughs> brain's not working very well. This well, is going to be embarrassing. What is it? Uh, it's Mickey Mantle. Oh it's, my oh, gosh, no. it's Jeez. Mickey Mantle. Oh. Oh. Yeah, the that, great that, Mick. I mean, that's that's <laughs> embarrassing. I'm embarrassed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, folks, that's a wrap for episode number 70 of Legends in Leadership. And uh, on behalf of our guest, uh, Andy Harvey, as well as my co-hosts, Dr. Blair Ritchie and Tyler Tallman, want to wish you a good day. And remember this, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, then you are a leader. Legends in Leadership is brought to you by the Carrington Group. Carrington Group is a family office with a passion for helping business leaders and their families make smart choices and fulfill their highest aspirations. To learn more about the Carrington Group, visit their website at www.carringtonfo.com or Google Carrington Group Dallas, Texas. ISF is committed to leadership development for aged out foster care and orphaned youth. ISF's mission is to transform these youth into tomorrow's leaders with scholarships, mentoring, and leadership training. To learn more about ISF, visit their website at isfsite.org or Google International Student Foundation to learn more. Securities offered through Regulus Advisors, LLC, member FINRA slash SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Regal Investment Advisors, LLC, and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. Regulus Advisors and Regal Investment Advisors are affiliated entities. Carrington